uh, we have um, two panel members here, um, Warniga Goel and uh, Priyadarshi uh, Dash. Uh, Warniga Goel is co-founder and research director of Timbit, and she is an experienced fintech research analyst, and she works on areas such as neo banking, open banking, and SME banking. Uh, Professor Priyadrashi Dutch associated with research and information systems for uh, developing countries, RIS, in New Delhi. And his research interest is more about development strategies, service, trade, and fintech. And he contributed to the debates on G20, Indo-Pacific, and Asia-Africa growth network. So with these words, uh, let me invite our panelists to say uh, their perspective about these presentations in their first round of reaction. And after that, we will get uh, comments and questions from our audience as well. You can raise your hand at that point of time. Otherwise, you want to raise some points, please put it on the chat. We will pick it up. So let me start with Varniga first. Varniga, please. Thank you, Dankam. Um, I'm apologizing for my voice again, uh, not feeling too well today. So um, thank you, uh, keynote speakers. I think that was a really interesting uh, presentation. I would like to start with uh, Sundar's presentation. And I personally have um, commissioned a research where uh, we were analyzing customer onboarding journeys for payment banks. And we were trying to assess how um, frictionless is the onboarding journey for uh, payment banks like India Post Payment Bank. We had Fino Payments Bank, we had NSDL Payments Bank, and we also had um, Geo Payments Bank. And <clears throat> there was uh, we, what we were trying to really assess is that despite uh, uh, the digital journey that has been devised by these payment banks and through the push of the government for financial inclusion, uh, the f it is not completely uh, digital currently in the nature uh, due to certain uh, challenges which are majorly uh, skewed towards uh, KYC. Uh, because as we as uh, through this effort, what they're trying to do is, uh, like you also mentioned in your presentation, is to onboard uh, last mile customers. However, in most of the times, uh, there are chances that these last mile customers have not yet gone ahead and uh, created an Aadhaar card for themselves or they do not have the identity and then the entire process gets stopped at that level itself and uh, there is a whole new process that opens up that you need to first establish a digital identity and then you can actually get into uh, <clears throat> receiving the financial services. Um, does um, these banks also um, and my question it is, uh, does these banks also support this kind of um, problem, the challenge of uh, first identifying that, you know, these last mile customers do not have an established identity and how can we onboard? And secondly is if once the onboarding happens, if there is a credit need, and since these last mile customers do not have a credit history or they haven't transacted this <clears throat> and would try, uh, need something called as microfinance in nature, which is a very short term, small ticket loan, how do we then try to service that request? Because we haven't established a, uh, what do you say, a credit uh, channel for these customers. Thank you. Sure, I will answer both your questions. The first one on, yes, the KYC, the last mile connectivity, getting them done is a challenge. Now with the video KYC coming in, I mean, that also need to be accomplished, completed to get the whole process done. So here is where the government has now brought in on, uh, there is a temporary KYC where you can operate an account open for about six months or 12 months, and then by then do the full KYC, make sure that it is done. But having said, yes, I think uh, one good thing happened, I would say today, other uh, penetration into the country as a whole is above 95%. I think that has really helped in terms of uh, ability to open bank account to all of them. But having said, the video KYC, getting that authentication done is not always uh, doable, and particularly the where they are, connectivity issues related to that part. But having said, that is where the partial KYC to get the account going and then 
probably in a six to 12 months period, do the full KYC, including the video recording and the completing the entire process. That helps in terms of getting them onboarded. And I would say, I think the, uh, the payments bank, all of them are also learning and improving because they realize how do we make it uh, smooth and the frictionless and uh, make sure that the entire process is smooth and that's the only way to get them onboarded and do that. So suddenly they are also fine-tuning this process of getting this done. But having said, yes, there are challenges need to overcome. But I'm glad at least what it used to be, let's say two, three years back, that have been resolved. Now, yeah, there are few areas still need to improve, but it has been vastly improved. And I have myself seen the new bank account getting opened in like four to five minutes. And if everything all goes well, they are able to get the functional operational account in four to five minutes. And that's really a great thing compared to what we have seen in the past in terms of getting a new banking account open. The second um, question on, I think in terms of that they don't have any credit history, how will they get lending? And uh, yes, I think the payments bank by nature, uh, they are not able to lend and they are not able to, they can only what the money comes in and do. But here is where the small finance bank comes into the picture. So they are traditionally like you take, there are like 10 of them, uh, microfinance institutions. They normally go give, even those who are not having any credit history, they don't have, they can't give any collateral, but they still need an amount and then they repay on a daily basis or a weekly basis to the repayment part. They use that with that and do. But uh, we have seen, especially these small finance banks and these microfinance institutions, they are able to offer the small loans with the no credit history, and then they just built it up from there. They give them a six months loan based on the repayment and then their capacity, how they are able to manage money, maintain their track record, they are able to give them more. So the microfinance institutions, small finance banks are helping them into that stage. But having said, I feel, I think now the, the whole fintech and the payments bank are also evolving. It eventually will lead on to also them able to offer and give them the smaller lending. I mean, not the big ticket uh, loan items, but at least a smaller one based on the capacity they'll be able to do. It is improving, but uh, yes, it not reached, let me put it this way, an optimal mark. mark. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sundar. So another thing that comes out uh, in this is that <clears throat> what we're seeing now in India and as well globally is the rise of digital ecosystems. So it is not just about uh, a, li a particular license servicing. Uh, so, for example, a payments bank would have a payments bank license and that would be more restricted towards opening an account, conducting transactions. But for financing, we have to reach out to a f small finance bank. But it is more from a partnership or, or digital ecosystem where a small a payment bank like uh, India Post Payments can also partner with a small finance bank and insurance distributor uh, um, and <clears throat> um, a maybe a lifestyle aggregator come together, create a digital platform, which is a one stop shop. Do you think that is a very uh, the efficacy uh, going forward and going to support again the last mile customers uh, financial needs from uh, an end to end journey standpoint? Because yeah. I know Geo Payments Bank is trying to do so, but the prototype is still not out yet. Yeah, and they've been trying to do so for the past two years. True. In a way, if you ask me, I think it's already started happening in, in small pockets, maybe as a pilot phase or yeah. maybe as an initial phase, they started doing. And uh, I think the good part here is, I think including the payments bank, even the large NBFCs, non-banking financial corporations or the microfinance institutions, they all realized the digital story now next phase is going to be Bharat. When I say Bharat, it is the tier three, tier four or the rural India. Because if you take the people in the metros and the tier two, tier three, up to tier one and tier two, I mean, they are able to handle, they get all that are required needed. And I mean, probably they are getting served to the extent needed. There will be an incremental, I mean, in terms of offering they can go. But if you take Bharat, and uh, that's where the, the rural India, where there's a lot more scope. Uh, definitely that is increasing now. And in terms of the small finance banks, they are able to partner with the fintech players and then they are able to go and offer. And uh, payments bank, they need to do. And uh, what I understand, I think there is also certain things related to the regulations in terms of what uh, products they can offer, what solutions they can give. They are restricted to an extent. But having said, I think RB is doing a great job, the central bank, in terms of 
uh, in bringing up of these payments banks, the small finance banks, and then trying it out. Like, for instance, I can give you, like the IMPS, initially when they opened up, the limit is kept at 2 lakhs. Now they have reduced to 5 lakhs. The same way, the offline payment to enable the rural payment where there is a connectivity poor, it now mm -hmm. just getting opened up to 200 rupees. It is so small, probably like 2 pounds. But the advantage here is, try this out, test this out. With the, it's offline, so there is no validation of balance in the account, and then increase the ticket size gradually. So with that approach, the same way, whether it is to lending or enabling the payments bank to go do more, or the small finance banks to go beyond the limit set in now, I think it is coming in. But the good thing is, there are a set of players who have the banking licenses. They can do, they can offer the set of products. There are a whole lot of fintech players they don't have banking licenses, but they can ride along with these who are having the banking licenses and offer a complete solution to the end consumers. So here is where the fintechs and the people, banks which are having the licenses to operate, they combine, collaborate together, and then offer the end product. Yes, there are pockets of pilot phases, initial things are happening, but we see in the next five years, it's going to be much bigger, much greater, and in terms of the reach, and how they are able to go through and do that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Priyadrishi, please. Please. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Professor Arun. First of all, congratulations to uh, both our keynote speakers for uh, uh, making uh, observations on the uh, fintech development linkages. I'll not be uh, specifically commenting on the content of both the presentations, but in the spirit of the session that we have, now how FinTech uh, provides the platform to address some, some of those concerns that we failed in a, a conventional model where now you have to go to physically to a bank to access services and other things. You know, what uh, Mr. Sundar Rajaram presented is the faith in the postal system. You know, the postman knows everybody in their village. And um, I myself have seen in my childhood that how, how one get excited if you get a message that you have got some money order from somebody and that the, and the postman comes and delivers whatever amount, the amount is not important, that something has come and he handovers the money and uh, even though it's a very small amount, he gets a gift from the receiver uh, because that, that kind of equation. So what it indicates that how we can leverage on low cost infrastructure available with us. So converting the Indian postal network to provide financial services. Earlier also there are options of opening postal deposit accounts. Not many of them were excited or many of them uh, found it attractive because there was no combination of the value added services. Now what is happening FinTech it is not just helping them to access of, uh, the traditional financial services, but also the ease at which they can do it, uh, uh, which uh, is hassle-free and also offers at a scale, which is uh, 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 optimizing the uh, cost benefit part uh, for the supplier side. Now, what is that we can take from this experience and try to Say generalize in terms of as a uh, low cost model of uh, uh, including uh, those who are unbanked. In the beginning itself, we got to know what is the proportion of unbanked population. And even though today, if you want to go to open a bank branch, the operational viability in some uh, locations could be questionable because the small size of the population uh, the the, the uh, operational uh, area of that branch, so that there are problems with that. So fintech brings hope that in rural areas, in unbanked population, you can go beyond the conventional financial services and offer some value added services. For example, you refer to UPI. I was looking at some numbers that in the last three years, from uh, as of uh, September 2021. The U UPI transactions were worth of 6,543.5 billion dollar. 
That's that's eleven times rise in three years. So what we are what we are witnessing is a movement towards a less caste society, if not no caste society. So th- that is a positive thing happening. So wherever, uh, regardless of the physical uh, location of the the uh, beneficiary or the household, the services are reaching. So this is a positive aspect of the inclusion. But what needs to be done is to replicate in other places, and uh, how to avoid the rat race among the fintech innovators. Now, what has happened? Everybody has started uh, started taking interest in the fintech uh, platform. The fintech startups are getting easy funding; they don't need any fixed capital. So that applies to both Uber's presentation also. How do you see it as a model? So you can operate from a, a couple of systems. Provided you have uh, a, a, some model to some fintech uh, innovation to offer, so regulatory sandbox is precisely does that uh, testing uh, in India, which is necessary. It's a controlled experiment and some third phase of uh, the uh, regulatory sandbox experimentation is going on. So once we come up with this type of uh, say endorsement by the regulator, Reserve Bank of India. And in case of other financial services, the other NBFC that others will also get similar kind of thing. Uh, what we what we do actually is to fill the gap uh, where the formal banking or the brick and mortar banking model could not reach, provide a complementary source, but also in terms of offering services with transparency. Now imagine. Uh, the the uh, government transport programs during COVID itself, whatever government transport programs, I'll just take a fraction of a minute. The, the direct benefit transfers were so transparent and so faster. It is not because of the fintech innovation. It is because of the digital identity created through Ada. So that the Jam Trinity experiment made it quite possible to. Uh, uh, say uh, for this kind of services. So both of you have touched upon the various dimensions of fintech. Let our uh, participants also participate in this thing. So precisely what is happening, retail payment revolution, uh, the speed and transparency to which government transport programs are going on, how people, uh, poor people with a smartphone can access information and uh, value-added services at a low cost. These are the dimensions which which actually fintech offer and justify the session. So with this, I close my remarks and get back if there are further uh, opportunities to intervene. Thank you so much, uh, Chair. Thank you, thank you, Prakashi. I think we we have uh, we have to allow um, our audience to ask questions, and I can see Nikki who has been patiently uh, waiting for some time to ask a question. Uh, so I think uh, we need to have quick reactions in terms of questions and answers. So shall I go to Nikki and then Sundar and Omar can actually respond to these questions uh, together. Is that okay? Is that because in that way we can save some time. Nikki, Nikki, please. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sorry, I wasn't sure what the what the uh, what the etiquette was. So um, I wasn't sure when you when you were going to take questions. So I I have um, a couple of questions. I think the first one is um, is for both the speakers actually. Um, one of my PhD students is uh, is actually on the on the on the governing board of the Central Bank of Iraq, and his PhD is. Um, really uh, at the intersection a little bit of both the presentations because it's about um, how to how to ensure social inclu- uh, sorry financial inclusion as they try to rebuild the sort of payments infrastructure of the country in Iraq. Um, the one thing that sort of struck me because he's done a sort of very extensive and exhaustive um, literature review is to see really what a kind of fragmented concept financial inclusion is. So, you know, it ranges from, you know, very sort of blunt kind of quantitative measurements in terms, you know, accounts per million, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, to kind of much more kind of uh, nuanced um, uh, kind of uh, social cultural indicators. Obviously, you know, bear in mind that being Iraq, they have a lot of complications in terms of cultural, ethnic and religious 
inclusion as well as financial and economic inclusion as well. Um, and and what struck me was um, that a lot of the, the problems I see with almost the entire literature on financial inclusion basically come under the umbrella of what Omar was presenting, you know, because of the, the interdependencies between a lot of the, the, the kind of um, indicators used in, in, in the literature. So I was sort of, um, I, I was wondering in practice how, when you were looking at financial inclusion, you did try to measure it or to assess it some way. And, and then to Omar, if, if he could see a way of taking his method from um, uh, you know developmental goals to something more specific like financial inclusion, and and I, I think it would be a really fantastic project because I'm pretty sure my student has kind of almost found every single paper about financial inclusion out there, and I think it's a huge gap there. And obviously, you know, we're talking about very many different literatures looking at this from different angles. So I'm sort of you know wondering whether we can we can come up with something useful as well uh, out of this discussion. And the second question was probably more for, for, for Sundar and, and relates to the question about onboarding you know, your customer that I think uh, Vernika brought up. We, my presentation yesterday was about um, the importance of say, a, a, a standardized identifier, but more the sort of very high corporate level with the, with the global legal entity identifier. I'm wondering though whether something like that, but at the sort of level of the individuals and of legal entities, which are probably not caught by something as as kind of high level as the legal entity identifier, whether that could be something that practically would be useful, or if if in the Indian context there is some provision for specific kind of uh, identifier standard or something like that that would address some of the onboarding issues, some of the know your customer issues and so on. So those were my my two questions. I'm sorry if I if there's too much there to unpack, but uh, those were my my two my two questions. Thank you very much. Uh, thank, thank you, Nikki. Uh, Anindya, uh, do do you have a very quick question because we we don't have much time left, only three minutes left for the agenda. But if it is very important, please shoot out. Uh, okay, so I just you know wrote my question in the chat box for Omar. So maybe Omar can just take a you know look at it, and I will request uh, you know the rest of you to please go ahead. And thank you, Th thank you, thank you, Anindya, for understanding. Uh, so Omar and Sundar, so we have wrote a couple of questions, and it's uh, you can um, you can have quick responses to these questions in one or two minutes. Uh, shall I go to Omar first, Omar? Okay, thank you. Uh, just quickly to uh, to Nikki. Uh, actually, it's interesting that you mentioned the financial inclusion. And when when Sander was giving his presentation, I actually had a, a thought about that because financial inclusion seems quite a, a broad topic. If you would build an, an indicator, it's probably built. This is a not expert opinion, obviously, but I'm sure it's built from many other indicators like financial literacy, which Sander mentioned. So, in the context of PPI, for example, as long as you have indicators on this issues like literacy, financial regulation, uh, easiness of doing business, I'm sure those three will have interdependencies that will uh, trickle down to financial inclusion without necessarily having a government program to push financial inclusion, but rather these other three more disaggregate specific topics. Now, um, let me go quickly to the comment, to the question uh, of an India. So, I see the, the question about the, the critique to ABMs from the Lucas critique. I'm actually surprised that you put it in that way because I would say it's the other way around. It's uh, ABMs are actually one of the best ways to address the Lucas critique. Probably if you see criticisms from the Lucas critique point of view to ABMs is because they're not criticizing really ABMs, but they're probably criticizing stochastic models without behavior. So ABM proper, properly defined in social sciences has a behavioral model underneath. So for those of you that are not familiar with the Lucas critique is this idea that we can take data, many times aggregate, which is the outcome of some behavioral process. And then we estimate relationships within this data, we estimate parameters, and then we make policy based on those parameters. The idea is that agents will react to the policy and will change their behavior. So the model that they are using is not valid anymore to, uh, to estimate the outcomes uh, of the system. And the only way to address that then is to go to deep parameters which have to do with behavior. In the concept of economic models, it has to do with preferences, for example. Well, ABM is one of the best tools to precisely specify a diverse set of behavioral models. And we do in PPI, actually, 
And we do have actually a specific paper on the Lucas critique and police ex ante policy evaluation, which I would be very happy uh, to share. So just quickly with that, uh, I close my, my answers. Thank you, Omar. So that please. Yeah, uh, so Nikki, what you raised is a valid one. I think in terms of the KYC, the Know Your Customer, uh, particularly country like ours, where the 1.3 billion population and then having them validated, maintained, managed, validated, and servicing the every single request of the need. And uh, I would say the government has done an incredible job in terms of managing it, safeguarding, securing it. And at the same time, authorizing who will be allowed to access for what purpose, one, in, ensure that there are only the authorized set of people can access to this data. And two, I, as a consumer, I'll also get a message if my records have been accessed for what purpose from whom, so that there is also a counter validation in terms of doing it. And uh, so there is a, a, a huge entity, the corporate that has been created to manage and maintain and run like the UID AI. And uh, that's an organization that owns, manages, monitors this data. And they continue to enhance and enrich in terms of uh, protecting, safeguarding, making sure that who is accessing the data you need to give access at the same time, you need to avoid a misuse of this information and then for any purpose and any reason. At the same time, uh, give access so that the KYC per se, we are able to do it on time and as per the need request, it could be from the banks for do the KYC, it could be for today that is being used for many other services. And uh, if I need to do on even to file my tax return and uh, even to now recently, it is even linked to the, the voter's ID and that's a really a good system, like one single identification that's being used across. And uh, so I think there are measures taken to making sure that it is indeed valid and correct and address the needs of the citizen. And at the same time, ensuring that it provides the required measures to complete the know your customer process very well. Thank you. Um, I, I think, Sherry, yes, I think it's your call, <laughs> please. Sorry, please. Uh, yeah, to both speakers, um, let me go to Omar first and the extent to which uh, his models are age-based and granular. Uh, I think we may have to have another conversation on that, Omar. Uh, let me go to Sundar. Uh, Sundar, the point is that financial inclusion in the study that uh, Tangam and I have made, you know, I'm of the view that uh, service for the poor becomes poor service because it, the, the funding gap is never properly identified and addressed. And you yourself said to me, that the Postal Bank and most uh, financial inclusion uh, projects at the moment are running in the red. They don't cover the costs. So you indicated that it will take a number of years. So this poss poss the possibility, this also um, sort of uh, covers what Omar said. How long will it take to get into the black for financial inclusion, let's say, for the Postal Bank that you've studied in great detail? And hopefully you're going to give us the data on it. Yeah, I, I think today, if you ask me, it is also serving the, the people bottom of the pyramid, the poor in the country, they need to get the benefit. And that's where the government has taken that initiative. I would say probably about in the next four to five years, they can probably turn it into be a profitable one. Because the, what has also happened here, uh, apart from taking over the, the, the Department of Post, the Indian Postal staff that are available, there is a huge investment that has also government has brought in on and bringing the required system, the software, the ecosystem, and it is available 24 by 7. During the pandemic, we have seen the volumes have just gone up and they're able to still service and support them and do. So I would say probably the next four to five years, they will be able to break even. But uh, it's worthwhile the investment in terms of uh, bringing off these people into the formal economy and then giving them the financial services access, which was not there till now. Okay, we, 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 don't, we, we don't have much time left, but quickly, Varnika and Priyatra said, do you, do you have something very urgent to uh, add on to this, please? Uh, I don't have something to add on, but like I want to discuss this as an innovation opportunity uh, within India, that cooperative banks hold a large uh, balance sheets in terms of supply chain financing for small medium enterprises, which also act as an underserved market uh, in India. I want, 
however the cooperative banks are becoming the slow dying segment within india despite their strong uh, hold in this sector so how do we create a digitalized journey where cooperative banks can actually create lending solutions or there is a digital platform that supports uh, lending and can actually uh, uh digitalize the supply chain from the standpoint of distribution uh, small vendors that come in for textiles or agrochemicals or petrochemicals logistics these are small medium enterprise from a large scale perspective manufacturing becomes the bigger uh, large enterprise group but at least from a small uh, vendor standpoint or distribution standpoint who need line of credit or working capital how can they get supported through the through a digital platform so if we can think about and maybe if, since there's limited time we can uh, take this question later as well or i can connect with sundar <clears throat> thanks for me uh, yeah. uh, sundar uh, hold, hold on a minute uh, priyadarshi do you, do you have Uh, no, other- I I have a similar observation, but not exactly on that dimension. You know what is happening in the first uh, uh, phase of my uh, this financial inclusion started with movement self help groups. That time digitalization was the not the more. It was inculcating the spirit of save saving among the low income households that you can also save, you can also convert your saving into productive capital. which worked but then what happened so many civil society organizations community based organizations started offering that so basics and others seva and others those who are successful models they started facing the problem of repayment so uh, after a point a five or 10 times of the uh, savings that was accumulated through the self help groups uh, that uh, five or 10 multiple of that they used to get the access to Uh, go for some low income, uh, sorry, income generating activity, and subsequently there are so many microfinance institutions. The repayment was poor and they failed. That is precisely what I was referring to. The race to bottom in terms of offering low cost should not end in, um, you know, becoming a mess for the whole uh, regulator and for the whole that thing. Now companies are there. Now the banks are thinking to. perhaps merge with some fintech startups so that small fintech startups becoming non viable and then make getting merged among themselves is not a uh, unlikely scenario one could think about despite of all these things that we are good good things that we are facing now so how to see such type of failure or consolidation or banks competing with fintech platforms adopting some of them this type of uh, things could happen so we have to see but where it is going to step up thanks brother sundar your last comments please thank you sure um, i think the point to pranika what you raised on the cooperative bank is very valid the reserve bank of india is now that's a first of trying to bring them on to the core banking solution there are about 1500 property banks in the country as a whole getting them all onto the core banking solution so that that enables them to give them the backbone the back end processing engine needed to support the customer base install but what you say is absolutely bang on it's valid both the consumer and the sme that are being serviced to buy the cooperative banks they are not very well equipped in all respects and they need to do but having said now if you look at in the last year or two the each state for all the cooperative banks within that state like kerala state cooperative banks Tamil Nadu state cooperative banks, Gujarat state cooperative banks. The state government is taking that initiative, saying, "Look, these are all the cooperative banks I have in my state. How do I bring them on onto?" So there is a clearly a move now that is taking place. Probably have them all on cloud on a SaaS model, offer to these cooperative banks the complete banking services they do, so that take from the channel, the digital layer to the backend processing layer, the servicing part, everything can be given. Because individually, these thousand five hundred cooperative banks having this entire technology ecosystem and their mm-hmm. ability to run is a huge task. So they can just pay by use, pay by transaction though. But having said, it need to be. It's all very small ticket size, very small amounts, and the transaction cost needs to be also very very minimal, very very less, so that they can afford to. They can also use these kind of extended services and though that equation need to get worked out. 
but at least there are steps that are being taken place on the next step, uh, the cooperative banks, the regional rural banks, how they can do in terms of come up the curve and addressing the needs of the customers and making use of the digital infrastructure that is available to offer best to the customers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sundar. Thank I you. think it's, it's a time to conclude our session. Uh, we are late by 10 minutes, but looking at the, the nature and depth of discussions, 10 minutes is not a not a big big lapse. Uh, thank you, Sundar and Omar for two very illuminating lectures, very illuminating lectures. Personally, I learned quite a lot from the experience and also the, the new approach of policy evaluations there. So thank you very much for your time and also your uh, presentations here. I'm sure the, the whole conference benefited quite a lot out of it. And thank you, Priyadarshi and Varniga for your comments and Nikki, Sherry, and Adindia for your comments too.